respiratory system. What's really funny about this particular file is that the very first thing we're going to do on slide two is, well, we're going to do better. <laughs> Because I'm rather critical of this. Oh, I wanted black. Oh well. Um, of this this list, we, we could do much better. All right. So let's make a, a more inclusive list. Now we'll be listing things that, that won't necessarily make sense right away, um, but that's okay because they'll be explained in the lecture. Okay. So um, we could start anywhere, but I'm gonna make my list on the same slide, and it will incorporate some of what's already on the slide. Um, obviously, oh, what? Tenure. There we go. Gas exchange. And if we can be thorough now, I think that'll help us in the end. So, uh, what are we exchanging? We're exchanging or giving up O2, surrendering O2 in exchange for picking up CO2 in the tissues or in body tissues. And we're swapping, surrendering CO2 for O2 in the lungs and when i when i say in the lungs i mean lungs as as a machine not lungs as an organ because lungs are obviously made of living tissue living cells that also need service so they they also constitute body tissues in that context okay um let's see what else could we put there that's maybe pretty pretty upfront um, the respiratory system humidifies incoming hair, air, I almost said hair, and uh, reclaims moisture. thereby helping us to um, prevent desiccation, drying out, which is a, a huge threat faced by terrestrial organisms. And it's gonna look like I've misspelled the word desiccation, but this is actually how it's spelled. It's two C's and one S, isn't that frustrating? I know, I look at that and go, Ugh. I'm creeped out. Um, same gist, the respiratory system warms, uh, adds heat to incoming air and reclaims heat from outgoing air. Right? In an attempt to thermoregulate. So we're not losing a dangerous amount of heat to our surroundings or gaining a, a dangerous amount of heat from our surroundings. Um, the respiratory system filters some pathogens certainly many irritants from incoming air. Uh, we know, just from emphasizing how creepy of a verb milking is, uh, that the respiratory system um, helps to move relatively low pressure blood as well as lymph, which is also under relatively low pressure. Okay, um, 
Let's see, what else is really obvious? We'll go with this one. And this one is represented certainly on this slide as speech. But speech isn't the only sound that we produce. Okay, let's see. Is there anything else really obvious that I want to go with here? Um, this one, I always forget this one. It's so obvious. Smell. Um, yep, 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 yep. All right, now this one's not as obvious, and I'll have to explain it later for it to really click. The respiratory system provides us the leverage that we need to apply pressure to certain masses. Um, for instance, eliminating a stool, uh, forcibly coughing, um, lifting something fairly heavy, uh, forcibly sneezing, although when is a sneeze not forcible? Redundant. Uh, delivering a baby. Okay. Uh, because our respiratory system allows us to do something called the Valsalva maneuver. Which, again, I'll explain later. Did I spell maneuver? Oh, what a weird word. I hope I got that right. And then this one maybe isn't, isn't super obvious, but boy, is it important. Our respiratory system, along with our kidneys, so, so the, the chief regulators here are lungs and kidneys. huge impact on pH balance. Usually what we're concerned of with is, is the pH of blood. Okay, so that pH is kept balanced via efforts of both the lungs and the kidneys. Okay, and we'll come back to that much later in this lecture. Right, but that's a much longer list than five bullets. So that's why I'm not super impressed with this particular slide okay um and i and and i much rather that you um be able to come up with a, a large list right let's go to the next slide which actually reiterates a little bit for us okay that that not only do we want to perform gas exchange okay not only do we want to perform gas exchange gas exchange, but we also need to transport, transport those gases, right? That if there's no circulatory link between lungs and other body tissues, then it doesn't matter how much O2 we inspire. It doesn't matter how great our ventilation is if we don't have the circulation to actually deliver O2 or to actually deliver CO2 back to the lungs, okay? Therefore, most of the functions of the respiratory system are very tightly interwoven with the circulatory system. Circulatory system doesn't do its, its complete job without respiratory system. Respiratory system can't do its complete job without its circulatory system, okay? So very um, co-dependent, if you will. Let's start looking at anatomy on slide four. And we're gonna kind of start superior and head in almost as if we're magic school busing uh, along with some incoming or inhaled air, okay? And a reminder that we have um, four chief sets of paranasal sinuses. Frontal sinuses. Maxillary sinuses. Ethmoid sinuses or ethmoid air cells, same thing. Oops. Just happened. 
That was weird. Er Always pressing a funny button every single lecture. And sphenoid sinuses, okay? And we'll come back to their function. Hopefully you already studied them in 241, so hopefully this is review. Our respiratory system, anatomically, can be divided into upper respiratory system and lower respiratory system, okay? And that cutoff occurs in the larynx. And I, I like to use the vocal folds as a nice, nice uh, cutoff point, just because they're almost shaped like a fence. <laughs> Plus, there's a, a change in uh, the tissue that's comprising mucosae uh, at those vocal folds. So, so that makes them a more sort of obvious um, transition point, okay? Upper respiratory system includes the perinasal sinuses, the nose, the nasal cavity, um, the pharynx, which you probably think of as the back of your throat, but your pharynx is actually quite extensive. Um, whereas lower respiratory system includes at least the, the lower half of the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and there are many stages, if you will, of, of bronchi. We have primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, uh, the bronchioles, and unfortunately there are many flavors of those as well, <laughs> the lungs in general, and then alveoli, which some people will call air sacs. Okay, they're microscopic. Um, but you could actually see one with your naked eye. An alveolus, let's see if I can, if I can, eh, that's a little small, a little bit bigger. How about maybe like that? Yeah, um, an alveolus is about the size of a 12 point font period. So you could see one with your naked eye, but it would just look like a beep, okay? If each alveolus, singular, is the size of a 12-point font period, then how many could we cram into each lung? Right? Millions. Millions. Okay, so we have lots of alveoli, and it's alveoli that actually um, help to uh, serve as a surface for gas exchange between blood and the interior of the lungs, okay? So very, very important, alveoli. We'll come back to them, obviously. In the next slide, which is what, five? Yeah, five. Some of these structures are pointed out for us. In addition to some extras, um, and I've, I've put a, a line across uh, the body just to drive home. Hey, larynx typically is considered to be uh, part of the, the uh, lower respiratory system. But again, if, if you want to, if it, if it makes sense to you, you can, you can say that vocal folds are a nice um, fence between upper and lower, okay? Where this obviously would be upper and this would be lower respiratory system, okay? Here, nose really is just sort of an outward uh, expression, okay? Whereas all of this is nasal cavity, okay? And believe it or not, all of this is pharynx. Wow, that's a heck of a lot more than just the back of your throat, okay? And notice that pharynx, well, you may not be able to see it super well here, but, but we'll come back to this certainly. Pharynx is continuous with esophagus. Esophagus. At least on its inferior end. And the esophagus sits posterior to the trachea. If you do not know that the esophagus sits posterior to the trachea by the time you attempt to graduate 242, Honestly, you shouldn't be allowed to graduate 242. That would be akin to not knowing that your stomach sits more so on your left or not knowing that your liver sits more so on, on your right. Um, you, you, you have to know <laughs> um, overall anatomy. Good grief. All right. Well, sitting right on top of the trachea, which is this tube. This is, tu this is the tube that we call trachea here, okay? 
notice that it looks ribbed because essentially it is but sitting on top of it is kind of a an awkwardly shaped almost trapezoidal box and that is the larynx okay and if we think of it as a box that sits on top of the the trachea then um that actually might might uh work for you because some people call it the voice box inside lining inside the larynx inside that box are those vocal folds okay we'll come back to karina later because you can't quite see it as well as you'll be able to see it later plus i've obscured it with my notes okay we'll certainly come back to um the the difference between primary secondary tertiary bronchi okay certainly we want to be able to, to identify left from right um, so many times this quarter, not just where the respiratory system is concerned, okay? And then um, diaphragm, uh, it's pronounced diaphragm, but if it helps you, you can mispronounce it to help uh, spell it, diaphragm, that's just too funny, uh, right? It's, it's this relatively thin but still powerful sheet of muscle that actually helps to delineate between thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity and it's that placement of the diaphragm that actually allows us to achieve the mechanics of ventilation inhalation exhalation um, and also allows us to do that that crazy thing that i mentioned earlier the valsalva maneuver so uh, we'll certainly come back to that next slide number six focuses on the nose uh, the nose and the nasal cavity are in part what moistens that incoming air and also reclaims moisture from outgoing air, warms up, but also reclaims heat from uh, air, okay, warms up incoming and reclaims heat from, from outgoing, as well as filtering incoming air so irritants don't actually get all the way into the alveoli. The nose and nasal cavity are also resonating chambers, as are the paranasal sinuses. They, they lend resonance to our voice, resonance. And then the nasal cavity at its roof, its superior roof, houses our olfactory receptors. And we'll zoom in on those shortly, okay? The nose, again, is like an uh, outward or an external expression, okay, equipped with two nares, right? Everything has to have a special name. So nares are nostrils. One nostril is nares, just like testes is plural, testis is singular, okay? And that external nose is supported by, sure, two nasal bones, but also a lot of plates of hyaline cartilage and even a little bit of um, dense fibrous connective tissue, okay? Internally, much, much larger is our nasal cavity, our nasal cavity, all right? Which we're gonna look at next in slide seven. The nasal cavity is divided along its, um, midline by a nasal septum and i don't know if i can if i can sketch this but i'll pretend <laughs> i'm willing to torture you <laughs> um let's see if i can find a picture to to base my doodle off of uh -oh. there we go it's already bad, you lucky duck. <laughs> Where is this person from? Outer space. What are you drawing, Tessa? Well... <laughs> It remains to be seen. It's supposed to be a skull. Shut up. <laughs> it's so bad. Look how silly it is. Okay. Anyway, frontal view 
of the skull, right? Here would be nasal bones. Gosh, I want this to be even finer. Okay. And then here, we'd have to look into that cavity, that nasal cavity. We can see, oh, it's divided along its midline by a septum, a wall, a partition, okay? And that partition is actually comprised of two bones, okay? So if this was frontal, embarrassing frontal, <laughs> it's that lower jaw, it's the mandible that, that really makes it maximally embarrassing. So, of course, now I'm trying to save my butt by polishing that off, right? We can't release that into the wild. <laughs> okay, just stop. <laughs> so bad. Anywho, if we were to um, look at the skull in a lateral view and even uh, take a lateral section, in other words, um, take a sagittal section, you know, cut along here or, or even parasagittal, a little off center, okay? then we would better see that that inside that nasal cavity, inside that nasal cavity, most of what we're seeing from the frontal view is a kind of triangular extension of the very boxy ethmoid. Bone. Oops, I don't like that. What just happened? There we go. Okay, name the bone ethmoid bone. Name the bone marking. This, you may recall, is perpendicular plate. And for some reason, I'm, I'm kind of remembering, even though it feels like years ago now, um, I think... I went over this in the um, 242 survival kit, although we can't imagine why at this moment, okay? And we'll use a different color. Now we can also see, oh, the posterior portion of the nasal septum of this wall requires another brick. There are two bricks in this wall. Okay, and this second brick, I really can't see from the frontal view or in the frontal view because it tapers down to almost nothing, right? In, in, the, in the anterior aspect, right? It's bulkiest or tallest or, or most conspicuous in the posterior aspect. And so just in case... This is posterior, this is anterior, and again, this is a lateral view of the nasal septum, all right? Who is this guy? It's not a bone marking, it is a bone. The vomer, it's not paired, it's a singleton, okay? And if we go back and look at the text on the actual slide, oh yeah, look at that. The nasal septum is comprised of the vomer and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, okay? The nasal cavity, its roof, its roof is comprised, not surprisingly, of the ethmoid as well as the sphenoid bones, okay? We have one ethmoid, one sphenoid, you probably recall that, okay? Its floor is comprised of a, a, an especially reinforced portion and a not so reinforced portion. And the reinforced portion is called the hard palate. It's reinforced by bone. It's reinforced by um, palatine bones. We, ha we have two, two palatine bones and maxillary bones or maxillae, same thing. We have two of those, okay? Here, this is hard palate. It's one hard palate, but how many bones? Total, four, two palatine, two maxillary, okay? And in this particular section, which is a sagittal view, 
this one okay we can really see how the ethmoid is making up uh, the roof because sure enough this section takes us through the cribriform plate and these little passageways in the cribriform plate which are far more numerous than one section would um, suggest are called cribriform foramina Foramina is plural for foramen. Cribriform foramina. And if I remember correctly, we'll come back to those really, really soon. Okay. The soft palette, I'll change colors just so you can see the difference, is here. Soft palette. And the soft palette bends down, dips down posteriorly to give rise to the uvula, the uvula. And if we look into the back of someone's oral cavity, you know, we say, ah, uh, there's the tongue, okay? Hanging down, we might see a shape like this. Hanging down, there's the tongue. We might see a shape like this. This is called a bifurcated uvula, and it's totally okay and totally normal. Uh, hanging down, there's the tongue. We might see a little more of a punching bag kind of shape. Oops. Wow, I slaughtered that. And not in a good way. <laughs> okay, in other words, um, the shape of your uvula can, can differ, right, uh, from, from the next person. I, I'm still being critical of that drawing. Tongue. A little more punching bag? I don't know. Anyway, um, soft pal is not reinforced by bone. Okay, and it's therefore flexible, and that's actually really important because that uvula is going to actually come upward, come upward when we swallow to help close off or seal off the nasal cavity so that we're not sending food upward into the nasal cavity um, where there's delicate mucosa that could be damaged, okay? The nasal vestibule is a little stage just inside the nares. Um, if you're brave enough to put your finger in there during the lecture, <laughs> um, if you put your finger in and turn the corner, your, the tip of your finger will, will end up sitting on a stage, and that's the nasal vestibule. Um, not a very big region, but it does house uh, a lot of what we associate with skin. Not surprisingly. Sebaceous glands, sweat glands, hair follicles, okay? Whereas the rest of the nasal cavity is lined with mucosa rather than skin per se. And that mucosa, most of it, let's go to slide eight. Most of that mucosa is, is referred to as respiratory mucosa. In other words, name the sheet respiratory mucosa, okay? But a small portion at the roof of the nasal cavity is called olfactory mucosa, right? Because yes, epithelium, okay? And here in this image, these pinky pies are epithelial cells. Here's an epithelial cell. Here's an epithelial cell, okay? Whereas this yellow friend here, this yellow friend here, those are neurons, okay? So here, the epithelium is acting sort of like packing peanuts for these neurons, and these neurons are sensory receptors, special sensory receptors. They're sensitive to odorants, molecules, 
called odorants. They're smell molecules. Odorants, okay? Notice that the axons of these guys reach up and through, reach up and through, reach up and through these passageways. What are these passageways? What is this? Comprised of pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Hopefully, um, from the small amounts of torture that I've that I've uh, already presented you with this quarter, you are at least starting to appreciate that you must know your tissues. Honey, you must know your tissues. The nasal cavity is lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So if I point at respiratory mucosa and I say, name the sheet, I'm asking for the mucosa. If I point at the respiratory mucosa and I say, name the tissue, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Underlying that pseudostratified columnar epithelium is a nice, dense network of capillaries. A plexus is a network, so don't be scared about that. All right. Why so much blood supply? Because that's actually how we interact with the air in order to help warm it and also reclaim heat from it. Okay, so why is that there for thermoregulation? All right. All epithelia, as you hopefully well know, uh, will feature a basement membrane, okay? When it's mucosa, part of that basement membrane is lamina propria, okay? And the lamina propria of the respiratory mucosa features oodles and oodles and oodles. It's embedded with oodles and oodles and oodles of seromucous glands, seromucous glands which is actually a little bit misleading to call them that because it's actually a collection of different glands. It's goblet cells and serous cells intermixed, okay? So that we're getting mucus, okay? And we're getting serous fluid, which ends up giving us a thin, a thin mucus. Why do we want thin mucus coating our respiratory mucosa? Because it's that mucus that helps to trap those irritants. Filter trap. Okay. And in that serous fluid are oodles of enzymes including but not limited to antimicrobial agents, like defensins, okay? And how gross is this? We produce about one liter of seromucous fluid, that thin mucus, every day. Ew! But that's how We're able to is comprised of pseudostratified uh -oh. columnar epithelium. Sorry. Hopefully, um, from the small amounts of torture that I've that I've uh, already presented you with this quarter, you are at least starting to appreciate that you must know your tissues, honey. You must know your tissues. The nasal cavity is lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So if I point at respiratory mucosa and I say, name the sheet, I'm asking for the mucosa. If I point at the respiratory mucosa and I say, name the tissue, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Underlying that pseudostratified columnar epithelium is a nice dense network of capillaries. A plexus is a network, so don't be scared about that, all right? Why so much blood supply? Because that's actually how we interact with the air in order to help warm it and also reclaim heat from it, okay? So why is that there for thermoregulation? All right. All epithelia, as you hopefully well know, 
uh, will feature a basement membrane, okay? When it's mucosa, part of that basement membrane is lamina propria, okay? And the lamina propria of the respiratory mucosa features oodles and oodles and oodles. It's embedded with oodles and oodles and oodles of seromucous glands, seromucous glands, which is actually a little bit misleading to call them that because it's actually a collection of different glands. It's goblet cells and serous cells intermixed, okay? So that we're getting mucus, okay? And we're getting serous fluid, which ends up giving us a thin, a thin mucus. Why do we want thin mucus coating our respiratory mucosa? Because it's that mucus that helps to trap those irritants. Filter trap. Okay. And in that serous fluid are oodles of enzymes, including but not limited to antimicrobial agents, like defensins, okay? And how gross is this? We produce about one liter of seromucous fluid, that thin mucus, every day. Ew! But that's how we're able to lend moisture to incoming air, okay? You hopefully know that about 99, 98-ish percent of the time, pseudostratified columnar epithelium will feature cilia on its apical surface and the respiratory mucosa is no exception, okay? These cilia help to guide that mucus, that seromucus, uh, thin, thin, right? Toward not just the throat, but we'll soon find out uh, the, the oropharynx. Okay, so that we can swallow it on purpose. And what we're doing is, yeah, we're wasting a lot of mucus, which is fine, we're making tons of it, but we're sending anything trapped in that mucus to the stomach, which I think I've, in the past, referred to as the pit of despair, so hopefully that's not new. It's, it's like our, uh, one of our last resort um, torture chambers, <laughs> okay? We're sending uh, any, any microbes that got trapped in that, that respiratory mucus to the stomach so that the, the stomach acid can hopefully murder uh, any yuck yucks, all right? Here's something kind of cool that, that might make you better aware of your cilia. And by the way, cilia and nose hairs are not the same thing. Most of your nose hairs are in the nasal vestibule. Okay. Um, you know how sometimes if it's really cold outside, you'll, you'll step outside from a warm building and uh, all of a sudden you get a runny nose, that's because your cilia don't, um, well, they don't work as well. They're not as efficient. They're not as um, as as metabolically active, okay? Um, when it, when they're cold, right? We already know that, that, that heat drives chemical reactions. So if we remove heat, then that's gonna impede chemical reactions. And so those cilia aren't sweeping the seromucous um, fluid, that, that thin mucus, they're not sweeping it um, as effectively uh, as, as they should, and therefore it's allowed to drain. It's allowed to run. Okay, so if you were wondering about the consistency of seromucous fluid, it, it's, it's essentially what you encounter when you get a runny nose. Okay? Good. Now, let's talk about the nasal conche. I think I went over these guys in the 242 survival kit too. And I think they show up in maybe a couple of our surveys. The nasal conche are kind of like uh, curvy shells. 
So if we're, again, looking at, at a frontal view of the nasal cavity, where this is nasal septum, then there'll be kind of like almost like a scroll shaped protrusion, kind of a curved shelf. And these are the inferior nasal conchae. Whereas here, these would be middle nasal conchae. And then uh, not evident in the frontal view, kind of buried above where we can see, will be the superior nasal conchae. And the middle and superior nasal conchae are bone markings of the ethmoid bone, whereas the two inferior nasal conchae are bones themselves, okay? So here's sort of some classic exam-ish um, questioning. How many total nasal conchae? Six. How many bones comprise all of the nasal conchae? Inferior nasal concha, left, right inferior nasal concha, okay, and the ethmoid bone, all right? And then here, this illustration provided uh, shows us the parasagittal view. And in the parasagittal view, we can see, oh yeah, there's that superior nasal concha, middle nasal concha, Okay, which again are um, bone markings of the ethmoid. And then separate, separate, here's the inferior nasal concha. Not a bone marking, but a separate bone. Really, the, what we're pointing out in this illustration is, is the mucosa that's covering these protrusions. But um, there's certainly what lends that, that kind of curvy, almost scroll-like shape, okay? And having these conche in place increases the surface area of mucosae that we can offer to warm in incoming air, moisten incoming air, and also filter incoming air, okay? Um, increase that area, right? And also to stir incoming air. Um, create turbulence so that more of the a larger fraction of that incoming air is coming into contact with that mucosa, all right? And then there's that note about reclamation as well. The nasal meatuses are, uh, let's change colors so you can see. They're the sort of underside a little groove that ends up being produced by that protrusion is a nasal meatus. And again, just more surface area. Okay, nasal meatus, okay. Let's look at slide 10. The paranasal sinuses, again, uh, frontal, sphenoid or sphenoidal, I don't care, uh, ethmoid, um, sinuses, or you could say ethmoid air cells, that makes sense to me as well, Max, ma maxillary um, sinuses, excuse me, two of each, they help to lighten the skull, lighten the, the weight of the head, if you will, um, they do secrete mucus, uh, they help to warm incoming air, moisten incoming air, and again, they, oops, I do not want that color anymore. Good grief. They contribute to the resonance of the voice. Okay. And I think I also labeled some, at least some of those in at least one of our surveys. Maybe a couple, in fact. All right, let's move on to the pharynx finally. 
And now that we're really zoomed in in this illustration on the furnace, we can better appreciate, wow, yeah, that, that is far more than just the back of your throat. Okay, it's the posterior of your nasal cavity, the posterior of your oral cavity, and even the, the region that sits posterior to your larynx, okay? And therefore, it's divided into three sections. Um, also, uh, one of the reasons why it's divided is because the tissues are gonna change as we march along. Our nasopharynx, this is kind of pink color-coded region, it sits posterior to the nasal cavity, as I just mentioned. It features the pharyngeal typo tonsil. Tonsil, just one. Okay. It features the two pharyngotympanic tubes. You might know these as eustachian tubes. And I don't care which one you use, that's fine. which function to help equalize uh, pressure, pressure in the middle ear cavities, okay? The soft palate when we swallow lifts that uvula up to help seal off the nasopharynx so that we don't send food upward into the nasal cavity, okay? And the nasopharynx is lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. In other words, it, its tissue is continuous with the respiratory mucosa of the nasal cavity, okay? The oropharynx, color-coded in blue here, is going to receive or convey food and air, which, yes, do end up getting mixed together, okay? It's posterior to the oral cavity, as I, I mentioned just a moment ago. It houses the two palatine tonsils and the one lingual tonsil, okay? However, it is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium just like the oral cavity. So its tissue is continuous with the lining of the oral cavity. And um, as I've mentioned before, and as uh, you may or may not have uh, come to learn in, in the slides a quiz, um, you must specify whenever you're, you identify a tissue as stratified squamous epithelium, you must specify whether it's keratinized or non-keratinized, okay? This is non-keratinized. The laryngopharynx is color coded here in this green, okay? And it sits posterior to the larynx. It is continuous with the esophagus, and it sits also posterior to the epiglottis, which is this flap here. Let's see, epiglottis. Okay, I think of the epiglottis as the roof of the larynx, okay? But it's a sunroof, I, I can open it, I can close it, okay? So it's it's kind of like a um, on a hinge, all right? And indeed, whenever I swallow, I'm gonna close, bring down uh, that epiglottis, and incidentally also raise up the larynx, but we'll come back to that, um, just to seal off the opening to that trachea so that I don't send food into the trachea. No, thank you. We'll come back to that. Um, the laryngopharynx is lined with, uh, let me go back to my original color, non-keratinized. stratified squamous epithelium, okay? So continuous with the lining of the oropharynx, right? Now I will come back to this automatically when we're, we're officially in the larynx, which I think is really, really soon. Um, but if we, if we go to the next um, slide, slide, slide 12, right, blown up much more, so that's kind of nice. Here's 
the opening to that pharyngo tympanic tube. Here's pharyngeal tonsil. Here's one of the two palatine tonsils. Here's a lingual tonsil. Okay. And then do you see this ridge right here? one of the two vocal folds okay and again i will come back to this but the lining of the larynx above those vocal folds is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium but the lining below is pseudostratified columnar epithelium in other words we're going to transition back to where we started Right? In nasal cavity and nasopharynx, we saw pseudostratified columnar epithelium. We're in a trans, um, gosh, what did I just say? Trans? I guess not trans, convert <laughs> back to uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelium to line the um, inferior aspect of the larynx, but also the trachea, okay? Which we'll come back to, I promise, I promise. Anyway, it's really nice to have a copy of this um, without labels so that you can practice labeling, not just the different features, but also the different tissues. And, and I highly recommend color coding just for your own um, good. Now, if we go to slide 13, slide 13 isolates the larynx. So we've taken it out of the, the body, okay? And it is this box sitting on top of trachea. Actually, let's extend that down a little bit further. There we go. Okay. Sometimes people call it a, a, a voice box, so that, that's kind of nice. Notice that what helps to suspend it is the hyoid bone. Um, single bone, not paired. Uh, it's the only bone in, in our body that doesn't articulate with the rest of the endoskeleton. And it also helps to support the tongue. But now we can see, oh yeah, it also helps support the, the larynx. And the larynx is a very reinforced box. But what it's reinforced with is cartilage. Now here's the problem. Almost all of the different plates, here's a plate, here's a plate, here's a plate, so on and so forth. And there are actually nine different plates, all right? Almost all of those plates are comprised of hyaline cartilage, okay? Whereas the reinforcement for the epiglottis this cartilaginous plate, that's comprised of elastic cartilage. E is for elastic, E is for ear, you might re remember the pinnae of the, of the ear, um, and E is for epiglottis. So hopefully you, you already know that trick or can pick up, pick up that trick now. The larynx, again, internally has a ledge here. That is the vocal fold, okay? That's what most of us are using to make sound, okay? Now, this little little ledge, which is, it's really um, rather minor in most of us, sometimes called the false vocal cord. There are two of them, so, so false vocal cords. I'm never gonna ask you about them, but I think they're interesting uh, because some people have more developed false vocal cords than others do. Most people have just well-developed vocal, vocal cords, not, not also well-developed false vocal cords. Well, it turns out that Freddie Mercury of Queen um, had uh, very well-developed false vocal folds. Uh, I just learned that recently, kind of interesting. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna point out? Oh, I 
know. This is tricky. So this particular view here. Frontal or actually I think I like anterior view better. Since we're not actually taking a section through the, the larynx. Okay. But here on the on the far right, where is anterior? Where is posterior? Where is anterior? Where is posterior? And most people have a hard time with this, understandably. For me, the giveaway is the hyoid is sectioned here on this side. This is anterior. This is posterior. Kind of counterintuitive. Kind of counterintuitive. So that, that epiglottis, it points posteriorly. Okay, so be careful about that. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, slide 14, I believe, and we add sort of that flesh element to the inside of the, the larynx, here's that, that sort of uppermost flap of the epiglottis, okay? And then here and here, actually, I give my second here a little bit too quickly and I'm changing colors just so you can you can um, tell that I'm outlining two different things okay these two are left and right vocal cords or fold same thing doesn't matter okay and then this and again I'm never gonna ask you that but this kind of like little pudgy region here Right, not very conspicuous, at least in this patient. Um, false vocal folds. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you. Don't worry about it. All right, those vocal folds or cords are are very elastic. In fact, they kind of act like rubber bands, in the same sense that the strings on a guitar have some give to them. Sure enough, when we exhale. At least when most of us are exhaling, we'll come back to that caveat in a moment. Uh, when we exhale and we want to produce sound, we we exhale and we use the force of that exhalation to vibrate these rubber bands. Okay, and it all depends on how stretched those rubber bands are as to whether we make a high pitch or a low pitch. All right, and that's also why. Males during puberty experience a lowering of their voice because their larynx grows outwardly and gets beefy and ends up stretching out permanently, stretching out their their rubber bands, their their guitar strings, their vocal folds, so that they make now um, these deeper intonations. Okay. Above that vocal fold, again, the larynx is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and below lined with Pseudostratified, and I never need you to just specify ciliated. It's okay if you do, but I don't need it. Columnar epithelium. Okay. And by the way, glottis, glottis, it's just the opening, the opening between those vocal folds. All right. Here, that glottis is closed. In other words, the vocal folds are... Um, slammed shut okay can i still have the sensation of choking even when those vocal folds are slammed shut oh yes because um they don't seal off the, the larynx the epiglottis seals off the larynx so if i fail to seal off the top of the larynx food can still enter the the superior most aspect of the larynx okay here the, the glottis is open 
and the vocal folds are um, separated. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say there. Slide 15 next. I actually just went over. Um, again, the, the, the length, uh, how stretched out they are, the tension of those vocal cords, just like the tension of a guitar string, uh, determines pitch, okay? Loudness, however, is determined by how much force upon exhalation uh, we're applying, okay? Exhalation. Now, is it possible to generate sound, speech, song, whatever, um, in order, or not in order, um, but during inhalation? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. And um, if you're... Uh, geeky enough or old enough <laughs> um, to know some Lord of the Rings references. Um, there's a, a character in Lord of the Rings named Gimli, and there's a different character in the Lord of the Rings trilogy named Treebeard, okay? And what you may not know is that they are performed or voiced by the same actor, John Rice davies And um, one of the reasons why you might not be aware that the same actor is playing these two very different characters is that John Rice davies delivers Gimli's voice, the dwarf's voice, upon exhalation, but delivers Treebeard's voice upon inhalation and that's why Treebeard sounds so winded because John Rice Davies is so winded <laughs> um, just some fun lore that might make it a little more clear as to how we're producing sound um, again our, our paranasal sinuses our oral cavity our nasal cavity they're all helping to amplify um, resonate right contribute to sound quality Okay. We also can uh, influence sound by shaping our tongue, our soft palate, our lips, our pharynx. Okay. Now on the next slide, slide 16, usually students go, what? <laughs> yeah, that's Elvis Presley. And the reason why I put Elvis Presley on, on my... Um, respiratory system lecture every quarter is because of how Elvis Presley is rumored to have died. Now, as far as I know, no one was in the bathroom with him at the time, but he did pass away in the bathroom and he was um, taking a lot of painkillers at the time of his death. Okay, and you may know that one of the side effects of painkillers is constipation. Okay, so considering how the bathroom was found and how he was found, it's, it's supposed that when he died, he was sitting on the toilet and he was wrestling. <laughs> with a stubborn stool okay <laughs> he was he was um straining to pass a stool okay and when we have to strain to pass a stool how do we achieve the force we need to really drive that out or how do we excuse me achieve the force we need to drive out a powerful sneeze or how do we generate the force we need to drive a baby through a very narrow canal right well we lean on the Valsalva maneuver okay the Valsalva maneuver maneuver takes advantage 
of, again, the diaphragm. Okay? When the diaphragm is not contracted, it's, it's at rest, it's rather dome-shaped, okay? All right? Whereas when we do contract it, it flattens out more. All right. Because the diaphragm is the partition, the wall between thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity, when the diaphragm is at rest, the floor of the thoracic cavity comes up and the ceiling of the abdominal cavity comes up. All right. When we contract the diaphragm downward, we're lowering the floor of the thoracic cavity, but we're also lowering the ceiling of the abdominal cavity. In other words, when we expand our thoracic cavity, we're reducing the volume of our abdominal cavity and vice versa. Sure enough, when we wanna push or lift forcibly, we take in a breath, and we hold it, and then we push. That is the Valsalva maneuver. It's expanding the thoracic cavity in order to force that abdominal ceiling down. And now we have more leverage. We have more um, pressure to push against. Okay, that's the Valsalva maneuver. And again, it's rumored that Elvis Presley um, was doing the Valsalva maneuver when he died. Now you might think, oh my God, I'm never doing the Valsalva maneuver again. <laughs> it's, it's a murder. <laughs> no, no, it, it's actually not what killed Elvis. Um, if you know a little bit about Elvis and, and when he was alive and when he was popular, um, then you probably can infer. What, what do you think... How do you think he might have decorated his bathroom? Really, really ornately, right? Uh, showy, really showy, okay? And what do you think maybe was on the floor? Yeah, believe it or not, carpet. <laughs> but what kind of carpet? Shag carpet. Shag carpet has very, very long fibers. Uh, it's, it's almost like putting like a, a fuzzy fur coat on your floor. Okay. Well, when he passed out, he fell off the toilet and landed face down on his shag carpet. So what was the cause of death? Suffocation. Wow. Next slide. <laughs> the trachea. The trachea is only about four inches long and it's less than an inch in diameter. It's very flexible but it's reinforced with C-shaped cartilaginous rings uh, made of hyaline cartilage, okay? And therefore, it is difficult to crush. So flexible, but um, not likely to be crushed, okay? There are three layers that comprise the wall of the trachea. The mucosa is innermost it's in contact with the lumen, and it's uh, lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Interrupted by or embedded by uh, specialized columnar cells, what are they specialized for? Secreting mucus, so goblet cells. A submucosa, which is comprised of connective tissue, um, houses seromucous glands like what we saw in the nasal cavity and uh, also houses those hyaline cartilage rings, okay? And then an adventitia. Adventitia is the outermost layer and it's comprised also of connective tissue, okay? At the inferior most 
uh, position of the trachea, the C-shaped cartilaginous ring doesn't quite look like a clean C. It looks like, to me, a pair of underpants. And so I remember Karina wears underpants. And um, you'll see this better in a, in a subsequent slide because things are gonna, just going to get bigger. Here, that is that, that uh, cartilaginous plate, okay? Well, that whole region is actually called the crina. And internally, inside the lumen of the trachea, we house um, an extra um, dose of irritant detectors, uh, receptors, sensory receptors, okay? If irritants get all the way into the carina, they've made it all the way down to the base of the trachea, then, uh, and, and those irritants are detected by those sensory receptors, then we will start coughing violently to try to force those irritants away from the lungs. Right, we don't want to get those, those irritants any further or any deeper into the lungs, okay? Next slide, which is 18, uh, shows us a transverse or cross section, okay? So that we can better appreciate, oh yeah, the esophagus, which is collapsible, sits posterior to the trachea, and the trachea ends up looking a bit like a horseshoe, because of that C-shaped hyaline cartilaginous ring, okay? Very, very thin. Innermost. I don't know if you can even see that orange that I'm using. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium, the mucosa, okay, with cilia. Okay. Whereas submucosa actually does, despite this image, um, include the cartilaginous ring, okay, but also housed in the connective tissue of the submucosa, we'll, we'll find the bodies, the secretory units of those seromucous glands, okay? And then outermost, here. Adventitia. Protective. Excuse me. Very much like a um, fibrous capsule. If we look at slide 19, we can see some of those layers, okay, where here's cilia and cell bodies of mucosa. This mucosa is comprised of pseudostratified columnar epithelium, okay? Here's the connective tissue proper of the submucosa, but here's the cartilaginous ring, okay? And it runs off the slide. So what layer of the trachea is not depicted? Yeah, the adventitia, good. Here, that C-shaped cartilage ring, right, hyaline cartilage. I see nerds in jello. I don't know if you guys do or not, but you don't have to. Some people see deli meat. That's fine. Whatever you need. In the next slide, 20, we can appreciate how dense the cilia of those pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells is. It's really impressive. Talk about shag carpet, huh? Next slide. Slide 21. Now we're going to start seeing branches off of the trachea such that the lower respiratory tract ends up looking like an upside down tree, okay? So that the trachea is, the trunk 
and the bronchi are the first large branches, okay? We're actually gonna branch and branch and branch and branch and branch and branch about 23 times. <laughs> oh my God, all right? But the very first time that the trachea branches, it's going to give rise to just two, just two bronchi, okay? A right primary bronchus and a left primary bronchus. I don't care whether you call these main or primary. It's just my personal habit of, of using the word primary, but they're interchangeable, so I don't care. Either one's fine, okay? The right primary bronchus is a little bit wider, but also shorter and a little more up and down, a little more vertical than the left, okay? Each of these primary bronchi, the right and the left, is going to enter its matching lung. And the point at which it enters that lung is the hilum. And we've, we've encountered a hilum before. Um, if we have a bean-shaped organ, whatever that, that organ may be, um, this concavity here is the hilum. It's an entry point and an exit point, okay? Anyway, um, those primary bronchi, they, they enter the lungs at each lung's hilum, okay? And then they branch. And when they branch, they give rise to secondary bronchi, which are also known as lobar. I, again, don't care. You can use either one. They're interchangeable. Okay, I just tend to stick with primary, secondary, tertiary, but whatever you like, okay? Well, all in all, we have five secondary bronchi, three on the right side, and two on the left side, okay? And one of the reasons why you might actually prefer to call these branches lobar bronchi is that each secondary bronchus is serving one lobe. That's why they're called lobar. Okay? How many total lobes then do we have? Yeah, we have five. Not all mammals do. Some mammals have different numbers of lobes comprising their lungs, but, but humans have five. Can you infer how many lobes you have on the right side? Yeah, three. And how many on the left? Two. Very good. Okay. Now, each of these secondary bronchi are going to, yay, branch again into tertiary bronchi, okay? also known as segmental, I don't care. Either one's fine. I just lean toward tertiary. Now be careful. Tertiary bronchi, when they divide, they don't give rise to quaternary bronchi. They give rise to more tertiary bronchi, okay? In other words, they get to divide and divide, okay? And the branches that they're giving rise to are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Once the branches are less than one millimeter in diameter, we stop saying tertiary bronchi and we start saying bronchioles, bronchioles, okay? Once those branches have diameters that are smaller than half a millimeter, we start saying terminal bronchioles. Unfortunately, terminus means end, and yet this is not the end. <laughs> really horrible name, um, but I'll come back to that, that bad news soon enough. Let's go to the next slide where we can really practice this idea of primary, secondary, tertiary, okay? Here's our trachea. Oh, sure enough, underpants. What's that region called? Carina. Okay. And then we see our first branching event. In fact, maybe these are Carina's legs. All 
right. These two, left and right, these are primary bronchi. Primary bronchi, okay? As soon as those branch, I'm using a green now, I hope you can see it. As soon as those branch, Secondary bronchi, this is actually secondary bronchus here too. And actually, I think the way that I that I color coded this might hurt more than help. So let me try. Oops. Not that you're like once I delete it, you don't see. Why am I telling you I screwed up? <laughs> okay, these three. Okay, are the right secondary bronchi, and these two are the left secondary bronchi. Okay, let's find another color. Whereas, oh, this secondary bronchus branched. Therefore, I must be looking at tertiary bronchi. Tertiary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and frankly, at this scale, even these are tertiary bronchi, even though they're further down the line and there have been lots of branching events since then, right, it's not until we get down to a diameter of less than one millimeter that we can stop saying tertiary bronchi and start saying bronchioles, okay? Same thing over here. Tertiary, but also tertiary, 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 but also tertiary, tertiary, Tertiary. Okay. It's not until we really get out to those tips that we're likely to start using the word bronchiole. So hopefully that makes a little better sense now that we're looking at a visual application. Now let's look at, quickly, slide 23. It's kind of a cool image just because it shows that respiratory or bronchial tree um, with, with all the tissue removed. So cool. Isn't that crazy? Beautiful. Next slide. 24. There we go. Now, if we're matching school busing our way um, along that tree, like from trunk out into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller branches, things are going to change along the way, okay? We started out seeing support in the form of cartilaginous rings, okay? And those cartilaginous rings, they do enter the, the lungs. So in other words, the bronchi, are supported by cartilaginous rings, okay? But eventually, as we get closer and closer and closer to bronchioles, we're gonna see those C shapes converted into very um, irregular, less predictable uh, cartilaginous plates, uh, sheets of armor, okay? And then eventually, when we are in the bronchioles, we're gonna replace cartilage entirely. We're gonna get rid of it entirely. Um, 
and rely on elastic fibers in dense elastic connective tissue to provide um, like a scaffolding of support, okay? The epithelium lining the lower respiratory tract also changes. Uh, when we're inside the trachea, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. When we're inside the bronchi, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. But as we get um, into those smaller and smaller and smaller branches, we're going to transition to cuboidal, simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay. And we're also going to see... Um, the cilia that were very abundant in the trachea and the bronchi, the goblet cells that were very abundant in the trachea and the bronchi become less and less and less abundant, okay? There's not a whole heck of a lot of smooth muscle in the wall of, for instance, the trachea or the bronchi. However, there is a substantial amount of smooth muscle in the walls of the bronchioles, and therefore, the bronchioles are very, very important in um, increasing and, for that matter, decreasing ventilation. And they do that not via vasoconstriction and vasodilation, but bronco, which we'll come back to later in the... Um, this very same file, bronco constriction, bronco dilation, constrict spelling, <laughs> bronco dilate. I'm just going to write dilate since I'm running out of room there. In fact, I can just get rid of um, these last letters bronchoconstrict bronchodilate um we'll come back to that terminal bronchioles i think i mentioned earlier are a bit evil so our tertiary bronchi bronchi they branch and branch and branch and branch, branch okay until they eventually give rise to bronchioles right and a plain old standard bronchial is going to be a tube whose diameter is smaller than one millimeter, but larger than half a millimeter. Once we get down to half a millimeter, we start saying terminal bronchioles, okay? And unfortunately, the, the word terminal means end. And yet, this isn't the end. <laughs> Horrible name. Terminal bronchioles, they feed into respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles feed into alveolar ducts and alveolar ducts feed alveolar sacs. Good grief. An alveolar sac is actually a cluster, kind of like a cluster of grapes, okay? A cluster of alveoli, okay? We have about 300 million alveoli total. So that's about 150 million alveoli per lung, okay? And the alveoli provide or help provide surface for gas exchange. Lots of surface. Let's go to the next slide, slide 25, which will help us not help us be, be less frustrated with these names, but <laughs> help us at least uh, apply these terms, okay? So let's say this is a very, very narrow here, tertiary bronchus, okay? And it divides, finally giving rise to tubes that have diameters of less than one millimeter, okay? These are terminal bronchioles, okay? But terminal bronchioles, they don't come into contact directly 
with any alveoli. They don't directly feed the alveoli. Actually, let's choose this color, okay? The respiratory bronchioles are gonna feed the alveoli more directly, respiratory bronchioles. And each respiratory bronchiole is connected to one, and you'll have to use your x-ray vision. X-ray vision, okay? One alveolar duct. Surrounding that alveolar duct are oodles and oodles and oodles of alveoli, and that entire cluster of many, 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 many alveoli is an alveolar sac. One alveolar sac per alveolar duct. One alveolar duct per respiratory bronchioles, or bronchiole, I should say, but many respiratory bronchioles per terminal bronchiole. Good grief, so crazy. Okay. Here, at the bottom of the same slide, some of those alveoli are cut away so that you can see here. You can see um, how perfectly round. I think of them as champagne grapes. Champagne grapes are really, really small and perfectly round. Okay. And sure enough, this tube, sort of at the core of that, that sac, and this is one sac, one sac, many alveoli, one sac. That's called the alveolar duct. Okay. And here, is a micrograph of lung tissue. And I think I put lung tissue maybe in your, your slide survey, but it's certainly um, on the practicum list, okay? Let's talk about alveoli. Next slide, 26, okay? The walls of alveoli are primarily comprised of cells that are called type, type one, alveolar cells, okay? And they are simple squamous epithelial cells with really a scant, scant basement membrane. Very similar to the scant basement membrane we saw associated with capillaries, okay? But also in alveolar walls, we can find less abundant type two alveolar cells, okay? Type two alveolar cells, they're not as concerned with gas exchange. We know that the specialty of simple squamous epithelium is filtration. So type one alveolar cells are the obvious good choice for gas exchange. Whereas these type two alveolar cells, they're scattered. So they're not really comprised of any tissue because by definition, a tissue is a collection of cells, but in shape, they are cuboidal, they're boxy, okay? And their job is to secrete some antimicrobial agents, but also surfactant. And surfactant is kind of like dish soap or detergent. Okay, it's a complex of both lipids and proteins, but I'm more worried about the, the function. The function of surfactant is to break the surface tension of fluid inside alveoli. Break the surface tension of fluid inside the alveoli. Whoa, why is there fluid inside the alveoli? Well, remember that as that air was coming in through oral cavity, coming in through nasal cavity, coming in through pharynx, it was picking up a lot of moisture such that by the time the air gets to the lumen of an alveolus, it's extremely humid, okay? And if an alveolus is a perfectly round container, then you can imagine there's um, risk of that container filling up with water. 
and it fills up with water, then how are we going to uh, efficiently exchange gases across that surface? Okay, so we need this surfactant to break the surface tension of that water, of that fluid, okay, because that fluid would draw the walls of the alveolus in on themselves, collapsing alveoli, no thank you, and also um, disturbing gas exchange, all right? We can also find that adjacent alveoli, alveoli that are sitting next to each other, will be connected to each other via pores. And those pores help to equalize pressure, not just within an alveolar sac, but really ultimately within an entire lung, okay? And also provide alternate routes, kind of like anastomoses do, okay? In addition to type one and type two alveolar cells, we can also find macrophages. They are roaming, but they're committed to the lungs, okay? Macrophages, and they're just kind of camping on the inner surface of our alveoli, just engulfing, phagocytosing, any, any foreign, irritable, I guess irritable sounds cranky, uh, <laughs> irritant. <laughs> Right, anything that doesn't belong, okay? And we actually sweep those macrophages up the trachea all day long and swallow them all day long to send them to, of course, our stomach. So these are macrophages that we're actually going to sacrifice in an effort to, to kill whatever they may have engulfed. Okay. We actually um, sweep up to the, the oropharynx for swallowing more than 2 million every hour. How crazy is that? That's nuts. Uh, the alveoli are also um, engulfed by really, really thin elastic fibers and of course, uh, capillaries, capillaries to allow for that exchange, okay? Now we do need to know all about the respiratory membrane. Personally, I think of the respiratory membrane as an Oreo thin. So you probably know what an Oreo cookie is, but a few years ago, they released, Nabisco released, um, a different kind of Oreo called an Oreo Thin, where there's uh, far less of that lard filling between the two cookies. So they're super, super uh, skinny, okay? Here's one of my cookies. Well, half of a cookie, because everybody takes Oreos apart. There's the cookie part. There's some of that filling, but not a lot of filling, okay? And then I've got this other cookie. This one's apparently pumpkin flavored. Shut up. <laughs> okay, and, oops, why did that not work? Nobody knows. I actually didn't put these close enough to each other. Just a little bit of filling, not a lot of filling, just a little bit of filling. Okay, and all together, these layers, cookie, filling, filling, cookie, make up one respiratory membrane. What are these cookies and fillings? Well, the wall of the alveolus, the basement membrane associated with that simple squamous epithelial cell, the basement membrane associated with the simple squamous epithelial cell that makes up the capillary wall and that simple squamous epithelial cell. So simple squamous epithelium, 
really, really scant, sparse, thin basement membrane. Really, really scant, sparse, thin basement membrane. Simple squamous epithelium, where one of these sets belongs to the alveolus and one of these sets belongs to the capillary, okay? These basement membranes are so thin that they actually end up being fused together, okay? And the whole cookie, <laughs> the whole membrane is so thin. It's less than half a micrometer, so thin, okay? It's across this membrane that we perform gas exchange. It's across the respiratory membrane, okay? Let's look at the next slide, 27, okay? Notice we've got three alveolar sacs here, okay? Here's an alveolar sac. Okay, but this one isn't enrobed, it's not wrapped, okay? Here's another alveolar sac, but this time the illustrator left those very thin elastic fibers, really, really thin elastic netting, if you will, around the alveoli. Okay, and here's another alveolar sac, okay? But this time the illustrator uh, didn't bother to depict the elastic fibers, but is showing how covered these alveoli are in capillary network. Not only that, but these capillaries actually um, invaginate into the alveolar sac and work their way between alveoli, which I think you'll better appreciate in a couple of slides. Um, this might help too, slide 28. You see how the capillaries are actually wrapped almost entirely around each alveolus? If we, if we remove those alveoli, leaving behind just the, the capillary plexus, right? then yeah, it looks kind of like they're, they're almost entirely wrapped around each alveolus, okay? Therefore, when I look at slide 29 and I see capillaries squeaking between adjacent alveoli, I'm not surprised. It's not just the sac that's covered in capillaries, the capillaries also infiltrate into the sac so that they can squeak in between adjacent alveoli, okay? Here is an alveolar pore, equalize that pressure, okay? Here is a macrophage, macrophage roaming, 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 but until we sweep them up and swallow them, they're going to stay in the lungs and do their, their uh, phagocytic job, okay? Here, every once in a while, kind of boxy, a type 2 alveolar cell, that surfactant secreting cell, okay? And it might help you understand um, how important surfactant is if we talk a little bit about um, Premature babies. Often, um, when a baby is, is born prematurely, they are not yet secreting their own surfactant. And so we literally spray it down their throat uh, and, and, and thereby supply them with surfactant so that they can exchange gas. Isn't that crazy? Okay. And then all of these guys, these fried eggs, Too many fried eggs in the frying pan. Right, the bulk of the wall. Simple squamous epithelial cells, right? And in this context, they're called type one, type one alveolar cells. So if I pointed at one of these cells and said, name the cell, 
type 1 alveolar cell. If I pointed at one of these cells and I said, name the tissue, simple squamous epithelium. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. And then this entire round structure is a bisected alveolus. Right? Okay. Well, we want to pay attention to a very, very fine region. Hopefully you can see the red. Itty, 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 bitty. Itty, 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 bitty. Okay. Where alveolar cell type 1 and capillary wall are in contact and therefore constituting respiratory membrane. Okay. And happily, the, the illustrator gives us a, a zoom in of that. Okay. We can see the simple squamous. I'm using red, which is evil. Hard to see. Dum, 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 dum. Simple squamous epithelial cell of the capillary wall, right? Simple squamous <coughs> epithelial cell of the alveolar wall, and then in between them, fused. Boy, that I'm gonna undo that. We need a different color. Good grief. In between them, fused basement membrane. Super thin. Okay. And here in this box, what I'm making. Ah, all of the components of the respiratory membrane. All in one place. That's nice. Okay, so obviously an important um, figure to study. Let's look at slide 30, where we finally get to start talking just about the lungs, or the macro anatomy. Okay. Lungs sit, of course, within the thoracic cavity, and therefore they are um, associated with some cirrhosis, okay? because the thoracic cavity has cirrhosis, all right? We have a parietal cirrhosa of the thoracic cavity. We have a visceral cirrhosa of the thoracic cavity, all right? But each lung is also surrounded by its own cirrhosis. So we have parietal cirrhosa of the lung, visceral cirrhosa of the lung, and between the two, in that really, 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 really thin space, serous fluid, just like we would with any other cirrhosis, all right? The cirrhosis that surround the lungs are called the pleural, uh, or rather the, I shouldn't say that, the cirrhosis that surround the lungs are called the pleurae, okay? We'll come back to that, I promise. I'm just warming you up. And the cavity, the super, super, super skinny cavity between the two, the visceral and, and parietal, um, is called the, the pleural cavity. We'll come back to it. Each lung, each lung has a helum, okay? Uh, entry, exit way. Who's gonna enter? Who's gonna exit? Nerves, blood vessels, our primary bronchi, right? The left lung, again, has two lobes, okay? A superior lobe and an inferior lobe. And if I were to point at one of those and say, name the lobe, you would hopefully say something to the effect of superior lobe of the left lung, okay? And these two lobes are separated, delineated by a fissure, a groove, okay? That's called the oblique fissure, all right? Also featured by the left lung is, um, well, what kind of almost looks like a, a missing area, okay? That's called the cardiac notch, the cardiac notch. It's only on the left, and it's where the heart intrudes in 
on the space that would otherwise be occupied by the left lung. It's one of the reasons why the left lung has two lobes instead of three. And I can remember which lung has um, two lobes versus three because the left has less, left less, okay? The right lung, of course, has three lobes, the superior lobe, the middle lobe, and the inferior lobe of the right lung, okay? The superior and middle lobes are separated by a groove called the horizontal fissure, okay? The middle and inferior lobes of the right lung are separated by another oblique fissure, okay? So both left and right lungs have ob oblique fissures. Only the right lung has a horizontal fissure, okay? The lungs are packed, as you know, with alveoli, okay? The rest, whatever remaining space there is, the filler is going to be elastic connective tissue. Expand, collapse, expand, collapse, okay? It makes the, the lungs really, really stretchy. And in fact, if we had um, a pair uh, of intact lungs, uh, like with trachea still, still attached, um, in the classroom, we could hook them up to the air supply in the classroom and watch them expand. And they, they would expand so much that you would start getting nervous about them popping. They just get huge. It's amazing. Anyway, <laughs> hopefully that was graphic enough. <laughs> All right, next slide is 31, okay? And we're going to zoom out of this guy's face. I don't like this guy's face. Here's left lung. Sure enough, there's this weird almost missing area, that's cardiac notch. Okay, here's the superior lobe, here's the inferior lobe, and dividing the two, an oblique fissure, okay. Here's right lung, okay, superior, inferior, and middle lobe. Another oblique fissure, whereas here, dividing superior and middle, horizontal fissure, okay? Here's your heart. Heart will be further protected by not just pericardium, but also mediastinum, um, the sort of hourglass-shaped sebum between the lungs. Anywho... Is there anything else there that I wanted to point out? I think we're good. Okay. Um, next slide is 32. I always like these trans these um, transverse sections um, because they really help me better appreciate how everything is situated. Okay. And in this particular case, I can also see the, the serose, so um, that white layer, this white layer, those are serose, this one being parietal. And by the way, the serose of the thoracic cavity are not depicted here. These are just the serose of the lungs. Okay, and again, these serose are called pleurae. There's the visceral pleura. There's the parietal pleura. Okay, and nihu. Good times, good times, good times. And my, oh, my screen is frozen. Please hold. Next slide, 33. So hopefully you recall when we were learning um, the heart, we, we found out that the heart is a machine that blood travels through, right? But it's also an organ, and so it needs service. Therefore, 
we had a branch of systemic circuit that actually served the heart and we called it coronary circulation. Well, we're gonna see the same gist where the lungs are concerned. We're gonna send um, part of our blood to the lungs to achieve gas exchange. So we're using the lungs as a machine in that context, but we're gonna send part of the circulation to the lungs to service them, okay? To service them. So pulmonary circuit transports to the machine, okay? But a branch of the systemic circuit that's referred to as bronchial, not bronchial, bronchial circuit um, or circulation actually serves lung tissue, okay? And these bronchial arteries, they branch off of the aorta and enter the lungs at, at their respective helms, okay? Systemic circuit, systemic circuit, systemic circuit, okay? Versus pulmonary circulation, which we've studied quite well, involves the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins. How many pulmonary arteries? Two, left and right. How many pulmonary veins? Four, superior and inferior left, superior and inferior right, okay? That's the pulmonary circuit. As if the word pulmonary was on this slide uh, enough. <laughs> okay, so be careful about that. Uh, next slide, 34, I think, yeah. Um, innervation. So uh, the lungs are dually innervated. Dually innervated. And remember that dual innervation refers to um, the same target being innervated by both parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways. Well, the effects of parasympathetic innervation include bronchoconstriction, and the effects of sympathetic innervation include a bronchodilation, okay? So you wanna try to keep those straight. Sympathetic bronchodilation, parasympathetic bronchoconstriction, okay? And um, you may have some success if you think back to studying the eye and uh, the pupillary responses. Remember that uh, the muscles that comprise your iris and therefore control the diameter of your pupil are innervated by parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, pathways right? And the parasympathetic pathway brings about the constriction of pupils. Whoops, that was weird. So if you already have that down from 241, then you can hopefully remember, oh, Bronchioles are the same way, okay? Whereas sympathetic fibers bring about pupil dilation. Oh, bronchioles are the same way. Maybe that will help, I'm not sure. But whatever you need to do, keep it straight, keep it straight. All right, let's look at the next slide, 35, which finally, officially brings up the pleura, which, which I've been trying to warm you up. Um, this is redundant to say thin, all serous air thin. This is redundant to say double layered, all serous air, double layered or dual layered, meaning a visceral layer and a parietal layer, okay? And um, these pleurae are sila, which I went over in the 242 survival kit, okay? That surround, or they, they establish sila, I should say, that surround the lungs. parietal pleura of a lung is closer to the thoracic wall, okay? The visceral pleura 
of a lung is actually in contact with the lung. And between the two is a super, super thin, super thin cavity called the pleural cavity, which is filled with serous fluid. Or if we want to be fancy, we can call it pleural fluid. All right. That fluid sitting in that super, super thin alleyway between parietal and visceral pleurae, it acts as a lubricant, okay? And also as an adhesive. In other words, the surface tension of that fluid pulls the pleurae toward each other, keeps these guys from pulling apart. Therefore, they move together, and that's very important. Okay, we'll come back to it automatically. Slide 36 is just an overview with everything labeled, just to practice. Always a good idea to come back to those really big picture figures, okay?